The commandments were written on the tarred wall in great white letters that could be read 30 yards away. Sometimes the work was hard, the implements had been designed for human beings and not for animals, and it was a great drawback that no animal was able to use any tool that involved standing on his hind legs. When Major saw that they had all made themselves comfortable and were waiting attentively, he cleared his throat and began, Comrades, you have heard already about the strange dream that I had last night. And above all, pass on this message of mine to those who come after you, so that future generations shall carry on the struggle until it is victorious. Milk and apples, this has been proved by science, comrades, contain substances absolutely necessary to the well-being of a pig. Whatever happened, she would remain faithful, work hard, carry out the orders that were given to her, and accept the leadership of Napoleon. These two had great difficulty in thinking anything out for themselves, but having once accepted the pigs as their teachers, they absorbed everything that they were told, and passed it on to the other animals by simple arguments. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. Their first act was to gallop in a body right round the boundaries of the farm, as though to make quite sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it, then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated reign. Napoleon acted swiftly and ruthlessly. A full bushel to anyone who captures him alive. The animals were shocked beyond measure to learn that even Snowball could be guilty of such an action. But Squealer counseled them to avoid rash actions and trust in Comrade Napoleon's strategy. The pigs did not actually work, but directed and supervised the others. He would put his snout to the ground, give several deep sniffs, and exclaim in a terrible voice, Snowball. He turned to go, then paused and added impressively, I warn every animal on this farm to keep his eyes very wide open. Boxer, who had now had time to think things over, voiced the general feeling by saying, If Comrade Napoleon says it, it must be right. And from then on he adopted the maxim, Napoleon is always right, in addition to his private motto of I will work harder. By this time, the weather had broken and the spring plowing had begun. Hitherto the animals on the farm had had a rather foolish custom of addressing one another as comrade. This was to be suppressed. In the evenings, he would admit privately to Clover that the hoof troubled him a great deal. They added that Snowball had privately admitted to them that he had been Jones's secret agent for years past. Nevertheless, without openly admitting it, he was devoted to Boxer, the two of them usually spent their Sundays together in the small paddock beyond the orchard grazing side by side and never speaking. Is it because this land of ours is so poor that it cannot afford a decent life to those who dwell upon it? The soil of England is fertile, its climate is good, it is capable of affording food in abundance to an untoed from room to room, afraid to speak above a whisper and gazing with a kind of awe at the unbelievable luxury, at the beds with their feather mattresses, the looking glasses, the horsehair sofa, the Brussels carpet, the lithograph of Queen Victoria over the drawing-room mantelpiece. Before long the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashions. The meeting always ended with the singing of Beasts of England, and the afternoon was given up to recreation. Throughout the spring and summer they worked a sixty-hour week, and in August Napoleon announced that there would be work on Sunday afternoons as well. There were only four dissentients, the three dogs and the cat, who was afterwards discovered to have voted on both sides. Each was sold at a year old you will never see one of them again. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. And you, Clover, where are those four foals you bore, who should have been the support and pleasure of your old age? Many years ago, when I was a little pig, my mother and the other sows used to sing an old song of which they knew only the tune and the first three words. It had been agreed that they should all meet in the big barn as soon as Mr. Jones was safely out of the way. All the animals nodded in complete agreement, and the clever ones at once began to learn the commandments by heart. They were all carrying sticks, except Jones, who was marching ahead with a gun in his hands. 
In the ecstasy of that thought they gambled round and round, they hurled themselves into the air in great leaps of excitement. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out there was a stirring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. They all declared contemptuously that his stories about Sugar Candy Mountain were lies, and yet they allowed him to remain on the farm, not working, with an allowance of a gill of beer a day. And even the miserable lives we lead are not allowed to reach their natural span. And I was a long way away, but I am almost certain I saw this he was talking to you, and you were allowing him to stroke your nose. This single farm of ours would support a dozen horses, twenty cows, hundreds of sheep and all of them living in a comfort and a dignity that are now almost beyond our imagining. I have had a long life, I have had much time for thought as I lay alone in my stall, and I think I may say that I understand the nature of life on this earth as well as any animal now living. The pellets scored bloody streaks along Snowball's back, and a sheep dropped dead. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. And remember also that in fighting against man, we must not come to resemble him. In past years, Mr. Jones, although a hard master, had been a capable farmer, but of late he had fallen on evil days. Old Major, so he was always called, though the name under which he had been exhibited was Willingdon Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. For myself I do not grumble, for I am one of the lucky ones. Alone among the animals on the farm he never laughed. Old Major, so he was always called, though the name under which he had been exhibited was Willingdon Beauty, was so highly regarded on the farm that everyone was quite ready to lose an hour's sleep in order to hear what he had to say. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. The two cart horses, Boxer and Clover, came in together, walking very slowly and setting down their vast hairy hoofs with great care lest there should be some small animal concealed in the straw. Word had gone round during the day that Old Major, the prize middle white boar, had had a strange dream on the previous night and wished to communicate it to the other animals. Mrs. Jones looked out of the bedroom window, saw what was happening, hurriedly flung a few possessions into a carpet bag, and slipped out of the farm by another way. There, comrades, is the answer to all our problems. Boxer was an enormous beast, nearly eighteen hands high, and as strong as any two ordinary horses put together. Now, as it turned out, the rebellion was achieved much earlier and more easily than anyone had expected. These two had great difficulty in thinking anything out for themselves, but having once accepted the pigs as their teachers, they absorbed everything that they were told, and passed it on to the other animals by simple arguments. If he were gone, we should starve to death. Others asked such questions as why should we care what happens after we are dead, or if this rebellion is to happen anyway, what difference does it make whether we work for it or not, and the pigs had great difficulty in making them see that this was contrary to the spirit of animalism. Their first act was to gallop in a body right round the boundaries of the farm, as though to make quite sure that no human being was hiding anywhere upon it, then they raced back to the farm buildings to wipe out the last traces of Jones's hated rain. Here it became apparent that Mr. Pilkington was about to spring some carefully prepared witticism on the company, but for a moment he was too overcome by amusement to be able to utter it. Frequently, he did not even appear on Sunday mornings, but issued his orders through one of the other pigs, usually Squealer. He was twelve years old and had lately grown rather stout, but he was still a majestic-looking pig, with a wise and benevolent appearance in spite of the fact that his tushes had never been cut. In any case he had no difficulty in proving to the other animals that they were not in reality short of food, whatever the appearances might be. She appeared to be enjoying herself, so the pigeons said. But it appears to me that that wall looks different. Let us face it, our lives are miserable, laborious, and short. Muriel, Benjamin, and all the sheep, 
with Snowball at the head of them, rushed forward and prodded and butted the men from every side, while Benjamin turned around and lashed at them with his small hoofs. Every Monday Mr. Wimper visited the farm as had been arranged. He had made an arrangement with one of the cockerels to call him in the mornings half an hour earlier than anyone else, and would put in some volunteer labor at whatever seemed to be most needed, before the regular day's work began. He had made arrangements with the cockerel to call him three quarters of an hour earlier in the mornings instead of half an hour. It did not seem strange to learn that the pigs had bought themselves a wireless set, were arranging to install a telephone, and had taken out subscriptions to John Bull, Titbits, and the Daily Mirror. Many animals had been born to whom the rebellion was only a dim tradition, passed on by word of mouth, and others had been bought who had never heard mention of such a thing before their arrival. Before long the other animals began to arrive and make themselves comfortable after their different fashions. One day, however, he arrived unexpectedly to examine the plans. Here, in the evenings, they studied blacksmithing, carpentering, and other necessary arts from books which they had brought out of the farmhouse. As soon as the light in the bedroom went out there was a stirring and a fluttering all through the farm buildings. Frederick, it was said, intended to bring against them twenty men all armed with guns, and he had already bribed the magistrates and police, so that if he could once get hold of the title deeds of Animal Farm they would ask no questions. If asked why, he would say that he saw nothing to laugh at. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring. He took his meals alone, with two dogs, to wait upon him, and always ate from the Crown Derby dinner service, which had been in the glass cupboard in the drawing room. By the autumn almost every animal on the farm was literate in some degree. But they were happy in their work, they grudged no effort or sacrifice, well aware that everything that they did was for the benefit of themselves and those of their kind who would come after them, and not for a pack of idle, thieving human beings. With the ring of light from his lantern dancing from side to side, he lurched across the yard, kicked off his boots at the back door, drew himself a last glass of beer from the barrel in the scullery, and made his way up to bed, where Mrs. Jones was already snoring.